Good evening. Welcome to the Billy Wilder Theatre at the Hammer Museum. I want to thank you all for coming out tonight during this presidential debate and for tonight's Hammer Forum, Counting Votes and Making Votes Count, with California Secretary of State Deborah Bowen and Loyola Marymount Professor Rick Hasen, moderated by Ian Masters. Ian Masters is a BBC-trained broadcast journalist who's covered national security affairs for over 25 years on public radio. He's the host of Background Briefing and Live from the Left Coast, both of which air, air on KPFK. Thank you. Yay, Ian. Um, on Sundays from 11 to 1, Ian's also produced documentaries for ABC News and Frontline, and he's edited a number of films and documentaries, including The Secret Life of Plants and Koyanis Katsi. Yeah, great films, really great films. Uh, he's been a senior fellow at UCLA Center for Strategic and International Affairs and the UCLA Center for International Relations. And he was a consultant to the Center for National Security Studies at Los Alamos Laboratory in New Mexico. So please join me in welcoming Ian Masters. Thank you. What happened to my shoe? <laughs> Thank you, Claudia. Let's just begin with a brief unscientific poll and see who will be the next leader of the free world uh, who will be inheriting this monumental and deepening mess for the next four years. Um, hands up those who thought McCain won the debate. <laughs> oh my God. Hands up those who thought Obama won. Oh my God. That's a landslide for Obama. Well, uh, I guess this is a blue state and I'd say a pretty blue crowd here. All right. In 2000, for the first time, most Americans got a glimpse of how rife with deficiencies and prone to gaming our electoral processes are. And at the end of a month of haggling and uncertainty in Florida, after one side outlawed the other, we saw an odd reversal of our Constitution where presidents pick Supreme Court justice, justices in as much as five Supreme Court justices picked the president. Since then, efforts to reform the various election systems have been met with a lot of money and new technology, but the results are unclear as a restive majority of Americans appear not to trust that their votes are properly counted and that their votes count. The resulting malaise and cynicism from Florida 2000 and Ohio 2004 up to 2008, less than a month away, lingers and perhaps undermines our democracy as much, if not more, than the enduring shame that we have the lowest turnouts, the most Byzantine impediments with a multiplicity of registration rules and deadlines, uneven access, caging, random purging, and a plethora of dirty tricks both major parties have perfected over the decades as one man's access has become another man's fraud. Rather than make it simpler, as they do in Mexico with a tamper-proof voter ID card that allows you to vote anywhere on election day, our efforts at reform seem to complicate rather than clarify as political gamesmanship blocks real reform. Democrats to try to enfranchise and empower their inherent majority while, while Republicans attempt to disenfranchise as many potential Democratic voters they can while making sure every last one of their voters shows up and are counted. One possible solution to this standoff that cuts across the liberal conservative divide lies in the national ID card that was mandated under the Patriot Act in the aftermath of 9-11. Perhaps advocates of Homeland Security can be assured who is a law-abiding citizen while civil libertarians could trade off their qualms about a police state demand to show me your papers if a tamper-proof national ID card once and for all removed all doubts that you are who you are on election day, allowing you to vote anywhere in the country or world for that matter and not just on a Tuesday. Of course, many of you may, many of you may disagree and besides, I'm dreaming. The states, not the feds, control elections. That was a precondition for the 13 colonies joining the Union. And of course, many of the founding fathers thought that only educated men of property should be able to vote. 
Otherwise, you'd end up with the people voting for a Sarah Palin. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, that just proves it's hard to be nonpartisan. And that's in large part why voter reform in this country is an uphill battle. Let me introduce tonight's speakers, who will each speak, give a brief uh, presentation, and then we'll have a discussion to refine some of the points and then open up to you, the audience, for Q&A. Professor Richard Hassan is the William H. Hannon Distinguished Professor of Law at Loyola Law School in Los Angeles, a nationally recognized expert in election law and campaign finance regulation. He is the co-author of a leading casebook on election law and co-editor of the quarterly peer-reviewed publication, Election Law Journal. He is the author of more than three dozen articles on election law issues. Richard Hassan also writes the widely read election law blog. His op-eds and commentaries have appeared in many publications, including the New York Times, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, and Slate. His election law book, The Supreme Court and Election Law, Judging Equality from Baker v. Carr, to Bush v. Gore was published by New York University Press in 2003. Ladies and gentlemen, Richard Hassan. Hopefully the screen will come up at, uh, there we go, uh, almost. There we go. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, you know, uh, every, uh, every four years, I get uh, a lot of press calls just around the time of the election. And then I fade back into obscurity as uh, is the, that's the kind of the occupational hazard. I have to say that, uh, I did an interview with uh, Ian uh, in 2004, and it was probably uh, he was probably the most knowledgeable uh, questioner that I had uh, in all my time of doing this. And so I'm very honored to be here today, uh, as well honored to be here with Secretary Bowen, who has uh, changed uh, some of the uh, direction uh, that uh, uh, election administration was going in the state and in this country. So I think uh, we're very fortunate uh, to have her here today. So uh, I'm going to talk briefly about the question uh, of, of whether or not uh, our efforts to reform the uh, system of administering our elections in this country over the last eight years has been a success or a failure. So have things gotten better or worse uh, since 2000? And it's a question that I ask uh, because uh, the, um, there was a lot of impetus to make change after what happened in 2000. Everybody agreed that the system was broken. And so I wanted, I think now, with coming up to our uh, second presidential election after 2000, take a little stock of the situation. So if we were trying to identify what the problems were with our elections in the last, uh, in the 2000 election, I'd say they fall into three categories. One category is voting technology. Uh, so one thing we learned from those uh, punch card ballots in Florida when they were being held up to figure out if that Chad was hanging or pregnant or dimpled or what it was, was that uh, the, uh, the technology with which we count our votes and the rules with which we figure out what counts as a valid vote, uh, the technology was error prone and the rules were inconsistent even within jurisdictions and certainly across jurisdictions within a, within a state. The second thing that I think we saw was that elections were uh, often being run by partisan officials. Uh, you can think of Katherine Harris on the Democratic, uh, on the Republican side, and you can think of um, Robert Butterworth, who many Democrats may not remember, but he was the Attorney General in Florida, who started a Democrat, who started issuing opinions about uh, election law when that was not in his field. There's a lot of partisanship going on uh, in how uh, the elections were being administered in Florida and elsewhere. And the third thing that we saw, and this came out as we went through the many lawsuits of 2000, is that our election laws were poorly drafted. There were ambiguities, there were questions, uh, and uh, judges were called upon to resolve these questions under the most uh, difficult circumstances, where the election of the presidency hung in the balance. And that uh, the combination of unclear laws and um, judges being put in this hot seat created a situation where the legitimacy of both the electoral process and the courts was called into question. So have things gotten better in the last uh, eight years? Um, well, there are a few ways to measure this. One way to measure this would be to ask about voter confidence. So are you confident that your vote will be accurately counted? That's a question that was asked uh, in a very reputable study out of the University of Michigan in 1996 and 2000, 2004. And it's great that we have 1996 as a baseline because before the whole Bush versus Gore controversy. So if you look at this chart, you can see around 10% of the people in 1996 thought that uh, 
their, the way their votes would be counted would be either very unfair or somewhat unfair. And then in 2000, you see this uh, big uh, uh, peak there. And then by 2004, we see a pretty wide partisan divide. So in 2004, 2.9 percent of Republicans thought the system was very or somewhat unfair compared to 21.5 percent of Democrats. And that line in the middle uh, represents everybody altogether, including independents. So what explains this split? Why were Republicans more confident than Democrats? Well, one reason is that Republicans won and Democrats lost. And so if my guy won, the system must have been fair. But if my guy lost, there must have been a problem. And so here's a little chart that shows you there was a big dispute over the gubernatorial election uh, in Washington state a few years ago. And they asked the same question about the process being unfair. The, in that state, the Republican was initially declared the winner after two lawsuits going up to the state Supreme Court. The Democrat was declared the winner. And look, 68% uh, of Republicans thought the way the election was administered was very unfair compared to 27% of Democrats. So part of this is uh, a, a, a question of who won and who lost. But there's also something else going on. And uh, I think what's going on is that we've seen an increased uh, partisanship in our electoral process in terms of the rhetoric that both the Democrats and Republicans use about voter suppression and about voter fraud. And if, uh, here are some statistics. This was uh, statistics uh, issued by Pew in 2006, a month before the midterm elections. And what you see is that 63% of whites were very confident their votes were going to be accurately counted compared to 30% of blacks. 29% of blacks were not at all confident that their votes would be counted compared to 8% of whites. And if you look comparing 2004 to 2006, almost a doubling of, or more than a doubling, of the uh, number of African Americans who were not at all confident that their votes would be accurately counted. So if we're looking at whether or not the uh, change from uh, 2000 to today has been a success, and we're using the measure of voter confidence, these figures are very troubling to me. It won't surprise me if we end up with uh, a uh, Democratic president here, if you take these, this survey, the survey question, this one here, and you ask this question, you're going to see a flip. And you're going to see Republicans very concerned about voter fraud and about how uh, foreign money has come into the election and how um, false voter registrations have been put in. And so uh, we're in a process where there is not a lot of confidence in the system. So if that's our measure, I think we are uh, in trouble. You all remember this guy, uh, counting the hanging chad. Uh, another way of asking this is uh, if, there's, uh, if things have gotten better or worse is to talk about voting technology. And the Supreme Court in Bush versus Gore said, after the current counting, it's likely legislative bodies nationwide will examine ways to improve the mechanisms and machinery of voting. And in fact, Congress, through the Help America Vote Act, put out a whole bunch of money for jurisdictions to adopt new voting machines. And things did get marginally better from 2000 to 2004. We had about a million fewer lost votes. That is, people who showed up at the polls uh, uh, on election day for president and apparently didn't cast a vote for president. We had a million fewer of those in 2004 than in 2000. So in that sense, it's been an improvement. But we still have plenty of uh, voting snafus. This is from the most recent uh, uh, Democratic primary in Los Angeles for uh, voting for president. You may remember that those independent voters who didn't fill in the second bubble, this is so-called double bubble trouble problem, lots of uh, uh, lack of clarity about ballot design, and also a lot of lack of confidence in electronic voting machines. And so a lot of those states like Florida that ran out and Georgia spent all those HAVA funds on electronic voting machines, they're now junking those voting machines because the public lacks confidence in them. And so now we have a situation where in Palm Beach County, they're rolling out their third set of voting machines in two elections, uh, in two presidential elections. They're on their third system now. And uh, if you just heard, last month, they had an election for judge. They lost about 3,500 ballots. And they found more than they thought they lost. And so uh, it. Every, every time you roll out a new voting system, it's going to be a learning curve. Just like if somebody introduces a new computer system in your office, it's going to be a learning curve. It's just unfortunate to be rolling it out during a presidential election. All right, so uh, another way of trying to measure whether or not there's success is ask how legislatures have handled the problem. And I would say, unfortunately, legislatures have not done a good job handling the problem. So you may remember when we had the recall uh, in uh, 2003 for governor in California. Do you remember that there were 135 candidates on the ballot? The reason there were 135 candidates on the ballot was that um, if you looked in the elections code, which is a big set of rules, and you turned to the rules for um, 
uh, the, uh, who, should be, who can be nominated in the second stage of the recall, it says uh, the usual nomination rules shall apply. So you turn to the usual nomination rules, which is in the 8,000 series of the Elections Code. And the first rule, 8,000, the very first rule says, these rules shall not apply to recall elections. <laughs> okay, and uh, those rules were applied anyway because there were no other rules. And those rules said anybody with 65 signatures and $3,000 can run for a governor. So you'd think that after the um, recall election, the California legislature would have gone in to fix that. Hasn't been fixed. No states have gotten rid of partisan election officials. New Jersey, in fact, has moved the job to a more partisan area. Congress created the U.S. Election Assistance Commission, which you probably never heard of because it has no power. And in fact, it had a vacancy. It was two de Democrats and one Republican. Republicans didn't even mind for a few months because the agency really had no power. So uh, in terms of legislative responses, I think that's been a failure. And as I mentioned, we have this now this hyper-partisanship about election administration. So go to Google News and do a search for, quote, voter fraud. And you will see the kinds of stories that come up. And you will see the kind of rhetoric that's out there. It is unbelievable. And uh, part of this played out in the voter ID uh, law debate. So here's a statistic. In, uh, of 10 bills introduced by Republicans in state legislatures to enact voter ID, 95.3% of Republicans supported those. 2.1% of Democrats supported them. So we have this, uh, these competing narratives about what's going on, with Democrats claiming there's a lot of voter suppression, Republicans claiming there's a lot of voter fraud. And this has made the system uh, people more suspicious about the system. And finally, looking at the courts. So uh, one uh, commentator said right after Bush versus Gore that the court's new equal protection standard in Bush versus Gore may create a more robust constitutional examination of voting practices. That is, we'd make lemonades from lemons that Bush versus Gore would be used in the courts to try and create fair election administration. Well, that hasn't happened. There was some litigation in the Ninth Circuit, you may remember, involving the recall. There was litigation in the Sixth Circuit as well, involving punch cards. And what we saw, which was, I'd say, one of the saddest things, is that even the judges in a lot of these cases were dividing on party lines. So for example, when the Michigan Supreme Court upheld its voter ID law, the five Republican judges voted to uphold it. The two Democratic judges voted to strike it down. And so even in the courts, we're seeing more of this kind of partisanship. And uh, here's a statistic on election litigation in the courts. So if you look at the period before 2000, we had about 96 cases a year nationally. That number more than doubled to an average of 230 cases. And you see the spikes in uh, the election years. Uh, and 2004 was the high watermark so far at 361. We'll see if this year beats that record. We've got litigation going on in Ohio. We've got litigation going on in Michigan, in Pennsylvania. And so it's become part of what campaigns do is that they have election law as part of their political strategy. And so let me just talk for a minute about two of the lawsuits in Ohio. One of the lawsuits in Ohio was brought by Republicans trying to stop people. There was a, an overlap window. You could register to vote within uh, 35 days, you could, you, could, uh, you could register to vote in up to 30 days before the election. You could start casting an absentee ballot in 35 days before the election. So there was a five-day window where you could show up, register to vote, and vote at the same time. And uh, the Democrats wanted to bring a lot of people to the polls, first-time voters. Republicans went to three different courts to try and block it. And the courts ended up allowing that to take place. Another lawsuit in Ohio, Senator McCain's uh, um, campaign sent out a bunch of absentee ballot forms. One of the forms on that box was not required by Ohio law. That form said, um, uh, check this box that you are an eligible citizen, uh, uh, that you are a citizen eligible to vote. Uh, Secretary Bruner, who's a Democrat, uh, who took over from Ken Blackwell, whose name you may remember from 2004. Secretary Bruner took the position that if that box wasn't checked, even though that box wasn't required, that uh, those, those absentee ballots would not be counted, although she said we could make some calls to see if those people are actually eligible to vote and she tried to give a backup system. So what we're seeing, I would say, is more partisanship in how elections are administered and, uh, you know, unfortunately, things are moving, I think, in, in many ways in the wrong direction. Um, why? Uh, first, election laws become more of a political strategy. Every campaign has an election lawyer looking to use election law as a way to try to gain advantage. Also, because of all the changes in laws and change, uh, changes in voting technology and this partisanship, more people are litigating, right? If you keep changing the machines and you keep changing the rules, there's going to be more litigation. And uh, so let me just end with what, what can we do about it? Uh, one thing we could do is move to nonpartisan election administration. 
Uh, they would use that in most other advanced democratic countries. You can look at places like <laughs> Australia and Canada. Uh, we could have centralized election administration as opposed to 14,000 electoral jurisdictions, which is what we use to administer our elections. And states could have election law audits where they go through their laws and try and figure out how to improve them. Um, uh, I, w there are also things courts can do, such as trying to encourage litigation early, so it's not in the position of trying to decide the outcome of elections. Uh, or some have suggested even specialized election law courts. I'm a little skeptical that that would overcome the problem. But the best solution to all of this is to move towards a nonpartisan model and to, uh, uh, and to try and create some more centralization. But there's not the political will for this. So, uh, uh, in, in going back to the question I asked, have things gotten better since 2000? My answer is no, they've actually gotten worse. And um, I'm not very optimistic in the near future that things are going to get better. And on that happy note, I'll turn it back over to Ian. Thank you, Richard. California Secretary of State Deborah Bowen is a pioneer in open government reform, election integrity, and personal privacy rights. Deborah Bowen became the sixth woman in Californian history to be elected to a statewide constitutional office where she was elected a sec when she was elected as Secretary of State in November 2006. As the state's chief elections officer, Secretary Bowen is responsible for overseeing state and federal elections, a role that requires her to test and certify all voting equipment. Her goal is to ensure that voting machines certified for use in California elections are secure, accurate, reliable, and accessible, and every voter's ballot is count exactly, get counted exactly as it was cast. As Secretary of State, Bowen is also charged with managing many business filings, campaign finance, and lobbying activity filings, the state archives, and other key government services. An attorney, Bowen most recently served 18 years as a lawmaker in the State Assembly and the Senate. She authored landmark consumer protection laws to protect people from becoming uh, victims of identity theft and closed the digital divide by authoring the first in the world law that put all of California's legislative information online. Ladies and gentlemen, Deborah Bowen. Well, thank you. It is um, great to be here tonight. Always interesting to listen to Rick Hassan, um, whose blog and uh, I read and articles I read for a long time before I ever shared a stage with him. Um, actually, some of what he's talked about is really where I want to key off from tonight. He talked about the concern that people have about the legitimacy of elections. And legitimacy, it really is the key to election administration. Because if you have a system in which people do not believe that the results are legitimate, you do two things. First, you start to undermine the very uh, participatory model that we rely on in a democracy that is characterized by self-governance. And uh, uh, second, you create a great deal of cynicism if people watch an administration, uh, whether it be city council, county board of supervisors, state legislature, or the presidency, in which uh, people who they do not believe were legitimately elected take actions that they believe are counter to uh, the interests of the population and certainly counter to what they think would have happened if a legitimate election had been held. So it's really critical to move us back into, a, into that chart that uh, Rick showed at the beginning where the majority of people, regardless of their party affiliation, believe that the election, uh, that elections are fair and legitimate. Um, clearly one of the issues for uh, this country since 2000 has been the voting system that we use. And I'm going to talk a little about that, but I don't want you to think that that's the only thing that we need to consider. And I know you don't, because we are also having discussions across the country about voter registration and voter rolls, and Ian referenced that in his, uh, in his opening. We're having a major discussion right now about the use of the social security number and driver's license databases under the Help America Vote Act to validate uh, voter registration. Uh, 
Uh, Florida has just begun on September 8th, I believe, uh, a system that requires an exact match between the driver's license and the voter registration. And that is a huge problem for anybody whose name is Jonathan A. but puts John on their voter registration form. Uh, not to mention what happens in a state like California that has a lot of complicated surnames, uh, some ethnic surnames in which uh, many of us don't know which is the surname and which is the middle name, uh, some in which both are commonly used as a surname with a space, and then plain old Anglo-Saxon names uh, like McDonald that can have a space between the MC and the D or not. Uh, or O'Dowell, which can have an apostrophe or not, and the computers are largely not smart enough to know that it's the same name, and indeed, they're not listed the same way in the telephone directory in many cases. So the, we're having that discussion with regard to voter registration right now. Uh, it is cast in terms of voter fraud. We need to know that everyone is who they say they are, but the other side of that is that we know that uh, computers only are as good as the data that goes in and that as long as the vast majority of data of voter registration cards are handwritten and or uh, translated into digital format by a human being, we are going to have errors in the system um, as well as people who just, uh, who, women who have gone from a single name to a married name or a whole variety of other combinations. So there's a lot more going on here than just the voting systems. But that is the first one of the first things that I took on when I took office in January of 2007. And it was because it was so clear to me that people were really uncomfortable with the, the uh, integrity of the voting systems that we were using. And as a legislator, I learned a lot from chairing the Energy Committee uh, during the period when, in which it turned out that uh, energy providers were, in fact, manipulating the market. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about how that was just the market forces at work. But uh, those of us who saw what was coming were very frustrated when we couldn't stop it. And then we watched what happened with Hurricane Katrina, where we did very little to deal with the prevention, and as a result, we're in a very difficult situation afterwards. So from that, I always take the lesson that it is better to do as much of your homework beforehand and prevent as many problems as you can than it is to have a problem and have to deal with it. And I think there is no place that it is more true than in the field of elections, because the one thing we do know about the courts is that they almost never order a do-over. So almost without exception, you have one and only one chance to get it exactly right. Indeed, the more, um, the more national, the larger the election field, the less likely a court is to intervene and order a new election. I have seen a number of uh, new election orders at the city council level where there have been irregularities. But what do you do if you have one state where there's an issue and the other 49 have voted? Uh, it's an enormous challenge for the judiciary to even begin to think, think about what kind of remedy you would use um, that doesn't uh, have, result in some different result than if everybody had voted on the same day. So I think we just have to aim towards perfection, and it's a big challenge. What I did when I took office was uh, begin a, a top-to-bottom review of California's voting systems, and that was just what it sounded like, a com uh, sounds like, a complete expert review of all the software, hardware, sor source code, and documents of a voting system. And it was conducted by independent teams of nationally respected experts, under, underseen by a team from the University of California. Uh, the people who investigated had backgrounds in computer security, cryptography, and information technology. And they tested everything from usability for people with limited physical abilities to the security vulnerabilities that had the potential to allow viruses to be spread from a particular machine in one polling place to a much larger set of, uh, of potential elections. 
No one at either the state or federal level had ever done this kind of an in-depth review before. And indeed, when the voluntary voting standards that had been the hallmark of testing voting systems were written, security really was not what they were written for. There was no security testing in the national standards that we were using. Um, and those standards were important, although it is a, uh, a very critical f footnote to realize that they they always have been voluntary, and states can adopt them, use their own system of testing, or completely ignore them. And we have states that do all of the above. So um, the transparency in this has been a, a critical part from my standpoint. The only way you get away from the perspective that there's partisanship in election administration is to make as many of the processes transparent as you possibly can. My goal was to be the voters analyst, basically to do the homework on behalf of voters and to do the hard science or to at least review the hard science that was done under the, under the uh, aegis of the University of California uh, on behalf of the voters of the state of California. We had a lot, uh, a lot at stake because we had invested many millions of dollars in voting equipment in California. but. To my way of thinking, the, it was more important to assure that what we were using was secure and accurate than it was to simply say, well, we've already paid for this, so we're going to continue using it. And those are really lessons that we learned in some hard ways in our aerospace program and that I think we all deal with all the time in our regular life. We don't wait if there's a recall on a uh, vehicle because the uh, transmission could go into reverse. We don't say, well, gee, you know, we've already manufactured this vehicle, so we're going to wait until the useful life of it is over before we correct it. We do a recall, and we call it in, and we fix it. So I wanted to get ahead of that curve. I wanted to get the questions of the integrity of the equipment behind us, and uh, we put the experts to work. And it was fascinating. The first day I went into the testing lab, I asked them, where do you begin? And they told me, well, the first thing we do is we read the instructions. And if it says, don't do something, that's what we do. So if the instructions say, do not turn off the power while the machine is doing this particular process, that's what we do. And we're looking to see if the machine will lose votes, if it will be corrupted, if it will be able to maintain its stability in that situation. So that's the beginning, and the, the documentation is really important because the first thing you have to be able to do is follow the instructions for the use of whatever it is and have things turn out well if you follow the instructions. But we also ask them to look at what people might do if they didn't necessarily read the entire manual. And I had a lot of pushback from some people on this. They said, well, all of our security procedures will make up for any shortcomings. We have a, a whole set of instructions and procedures uh, that do that. And I always uh, wound up asking those people if they had their cell phones or Blackberries set to time out, if they left them, uh, lost them, left them on a bus or something like that, and if they had read the entire manual for their cell phone or Trio or BlackBerry before they began using it. Uh, anybody here read the whole manual before you started? Uh, I, I don't think I've ever gotten a hand um, from anybody. We don't. We take it for granted that we know how something works, and then we take a shortcut uh, by skipping that part of the manual. And in fact, some of the security flaws that we found came about because we hadn't looked at how something actually worked in process. So for example, we had security seals placed on uh, voting machines on the places that where one might open the machine, but our testers were able to open the machine from the other direction by using a Phillips screwdriver and removing two screws. The security seal stayed intact on this side, the machine was open that way without the hinge in place. Uh, whoever it was that had opened it would have complete access to it. It could be closed again, the two screws replaced, the security seals intact, no evidence that there had ever been tampering. So we looked at things like that. Uh, we looked at uh, built-in mechanisms that are in use for voting systems. One of them is that they routinely have a key to operate them and that the key is the same for every single voting machine. 
so that anybody who had access to one key could open any voting machine. Now, you understand the reason for that in a state like California, where we had 24,009 precincts in the last election. If everyone in those 24,009 precincts had a different key, uh, it is inevitable that when you tried to open the polls on election day, you would have missing keys, keys that didn't, you'd have a host of things. So, but the result was one key opens everything, and as it turned out, it was a key that could also open a, a hotel, mini bar, or most file cabinets. So if you had a key that could do that, you could also open most of the voting machines in use in this country. So there was a lot for us to be concerned about and to get underway. The review was done in a very short period of time because the legislature moved the presidential primary from June to February uh, while we were in the early stages of the review. And I, as a result, had a deadline of August 3, 2007 to get the review done and to make decisions. Uh, as I said, we found a lot of security flaws. Some of it just a, a result of design, the decision to use one key and the same key for practical reasons and reasons that are understandable. Um, the fact that security seals were placed in a way that they didn't prevent opening of the machine from another direction. I had a lot of people tell me, well, you know, our, as I mentioned, our procedures will keep any of this from happening, and they likened the voting system testing to giving a thief the keys to your car and then expecting uh, that the car wouldn't be stolen. But I looked at, in my look at the situation, I thought that in many instances the thief wouldn't need the keys to the car. There are lots of ways to steal a car without the keys. You can hotwire it. Uh, you can counterfeit a key. You can have somebody who simply made a mistake and left the car door unlocked, or worse yet, uh, hopped out of the car with the engine running to go into the 7-Eleven and found that someone take, took advantage of that to disappear with the running vehicle. So there were lots of things besides just the standard way of, of doing things. And that's why it was so important to ask, what do people do if they're not following the instructions exactly? Because they're very complicated and people don't always read the manuals cover to cover and go through the instructions. As Rick said, the other challenge here is that in California, we have 58 counties with 58 different ways of doing things, a problem that pales in comparison to the number of ways of doing things that we have across this country, and that I think actually is one of our main challenges as we look to make our election system more understandable and more transparent and avoid the simple confusion that comes about when people see that in another state, um, anyone can vote in a party primary, but in your state, only people who are registered in the party can. Or uh, Monday, we had 8,000 calls to our 800 number hotline. That apparently came about because there were a number of TV shows where there was a crawl that said, in many states, today is the last day for voter registration. The last day in California is October 20th, but nonetheless, people saw that and, uh, to their credit, called us to say, what's the deadline in California? Uh, but the result of that difference from state to state is often that people have to do a lot of work to, to determine what the law is in their state. And with, with uh, 24,000 polling places in California and uh, almost 100,000 poll workers in any given election, uh, there are a lot of differences and potential differences from one cycle to another. So my, my response to reading the reviews in the top to bottom review was to strictly limit the types of voting machines that could be used in California and to impose new security restrictions and auditing conditions on all of the equipment that we use. Uh, California was one of, the, one of only two states that historically have had any kind of manual audit of election results that's a check on whether the, um, either the mechanical equipment, the lever machine, or the computers are actually tallying properly. Uh, a lar much larger number of states does that now, but nobody had really undertaken the work to say, what's a statistically significant number? How many precincts do you have to look at? How do you have to do this in such a way that you can be certain without counting every single vote in every race that you have the right result? 
So our hand check, I thought, was not sufficient. And we're now doing um, a much broader hand check, particularly in races with, that are within a half a percent, where we now move automatically to a hand count of 5% of the ballots. Uh, and we keep doing that until we're sure that we have the, the right person elected. Um, with regard to the voting machines, particularly the touchscreen machines, which were the most vulnerable, I limited them to one per precinct uh, for use for disabled voters. I think we've done a terrible job in helping people who are disabled in this country cast their votes independently. It is a very small market. Basically, the, the uh, solutions are not going to be driven by the market because it's such a small market. Uh, but for some people, it was the best solution we had at the time. So um, that's what I did on August 3rd of last year. I got um, a lot of uh, claims that there would be gloom and doom, and we wouldn't know for days what the results were. But 57 of 58 counties in California had election night results at about the same time as they had in 2006. So it really didn't make much difference how the votes were counted. Uh, there was very little change from the voters' side, a great deal more change from the preparation side, and we continue to work towards an improved system. I think the other failing we've had is that we haven't had a real fact-based way of gathering information about what the flaws were, what happened, and learning from mistakes either in other counties or in other states so that we can avoid those mistakes rather than have to make them ourselves. And we don't have a system that enables that. And in fact, the proprietary nature of the software in the voting systems that we primarily use makes it much harder, because you always run into this question about what can you say about what the problem is that doesn't violate the proprietary rights that the vendor has to their product. And that's something that I think uh, we will see changing over time. So looking ahead, uh, the ability to gather information, to always try to improve election administration, to see what didn't work well, what did. Uh, we certainly had, with the double bubble problem in Los Angeles, a good illustration of the fact that people don't always read the instructions. The voter booklet said, mark box five or six. I looked at it and said, anybody who knows how to fill in a touch, uh, uh, fill in the bubble ballot, is not even going to read that. Why would you read that if you already know how to fill in um, an optical scan? And indeed, we had thousands of people in Los Angeles County who didn't. We were lucky. That election wasn't close. But I don't rely, like relying on luck. And so we have to just to be much more rigorous in the way that we do all of this. There's a lot more to come, uh, I think, in trying to get our house in order um, and a lot of other things that we can talk about. And I hope that at some point we will get to the plight of our military and overseas voters. I just have returned from uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. And just the transportation time alone uh, is significant when it comes to having people vote. We're basically telling voters there that they should mail their ballots by October 15th. The rest of us don't even have to register until October 20th. And we're asking them to have completed voting by October 20th. So again, something that we need to work on. And as we go along, we'll continue to work to try to make voting available to every eligible voter, to have the rolls be accurate, not to take anyone off the rolls because somebody in the, in the office made a mistake or the computer made a mistake, uh, and then to make sure that, that we count every vote and that we have audited in a way that can assure everyone that the vote is right and that you all can go home and explain how this works to your grandmother who did not grow up with cryptography as one of the things that she understood how it worked. If we don't understand it and we can't explain it, it's not sufficiently transparent to use in determining who the next leader of the free world will be. So my standards are tough for this, but I want all of you to be able to go back to arguing about candidates and issues uh, and leave those who are the election monitors uh, and are, have been focused on the process uh, to worry about, about uh, oversight. We're never going to have a situation where oversight and questioning aren't required, but I don't want the majority of people to have to spend their time leading up to an election worrying about whether the system is going to properly report the vote. Thank you. I look forward to the discussion.
And we'll try and keep the discussion brief because I know you, you want lots of questions. You have lots of questions. Um, just, just to touch on uh, your closing statement, uh, Rick Hassan, the idea that, um, I mean, what, what in fact is your idea about how you can take partisanship out of the, out of the electoral system? I mean, if, if you empowered the, the third parties, uh, since the two big guys have, have proven themselves to be untrustworthy, or their impulses are such that they can't be trusted, if, I mean, if you gave it to the, to, I can't imagine uh, Nader, uh, um, McKinney and uh, Bob Barr running elections, but maybe it wouldn't be a bad idea, but at a certain point they want to become a majority party too. So how do you come up with a mechanism? I mean, other countries do it, but explain yeah. it if you can. Yeah, well, part of the problem is... Pull, pull the mic forward. Then. Part of the problem is we have a, uh, a long history in this country of partisan election administration. So politically, it may be very difficult to make the change. But if you're asking me how we could, if there was the political will, how we could implement it, here's a way we could implement it in California. Uh, we could say that the uh, chief elections officer of the state uh, will be appointed by the governor with a 75% approval of the legislature for a 10-year term. And anybody that can make it through the California legislature with 75% approval is going to be somebody, and, and this is a, a large supermajority so that Democrats and Republicans would have to agree. And it would be very easy to block a controversial person. And a long term would give some insulation. And so what we would try and do is um, focus on people whose allegiance is to the integrity of the political process, and so there's not an inherent conflict of interest where they have allegiance to uh, a, a particular political party. It hasn't been as much of a problem in California as in other states, but in a, a number of other states, the secretaries of state have been the campaign chairs for that state for their political, uh, for their uh, uh, presidential candidate. And uh, in California, both the um, uh, prior secretary of state and the secretary of state have, have pledged not to do that. But that's, uh, you know, this is something that could be mandated by law. I mean, that's, that's a I one step there, removed. I think there ought to be a law. Uh, but, uh, but I think we, we, if you look at Canada and you look at Australia, and I actually went over to Australia and met with their officials, they have a, 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 you know, you can call them bureaucrats, but they have a professionalized system and they have long-term appointments of uh, non-political appointees. And in fact, in Great Britain, in order to be on uh, some of their electoral commissions, you have to have a history of not engaging in partisan political activities. So you can be register for a, with a party. You don't have to have no political identity, but you can't be someone who's active in party affairs. So that would be a way mm. to, to do it. There are, there are various ways to do it, but as I said, the biggest problem is political will, uh, I think, in getting it done. And I think in states without an initiative system, it's even harder because then it's hard to see why a legislature uh, would want to make a change. And of course, in Australia, they f you get fined if you don't vote. <laughs> well, in theory, uh, you get fined if you don't vote. Well, yeah, I know, I know, but it does have, it, I think it, it creates about 90% uh, uh, regular uh, attendance or franchise. Um, I spoke with uh, Mina Perez, uh, who did the study at the Brennan Center on, on uh, voting purges throughout the country for uh, most of the big states, including most of the swing states. And it was alarming uh, that sh the conclusion she came to was that there is, ab there is no transparency about how these lists are purged, that essentially faceless, nameless bureaucrats sit at computer screens and toss names out, and the person who shows up to vote, whose name was tossed out, essentially is blindsided and has no recourse. Well, provi provisional voting is supposed to solve some of that problem, and it in fact does, um, uh, because bef at least you have a mechanism by which you can uh, cast the ballot provisionally and then argue that it should be counted. but. Uh, I'm seeing provisional voting used as a way for a voter uh, who, who well, I just was reading a story about a voter, a um, retired veteran who had a military ID and a driver's license with his prior address on it and wasn't allowed to vote in a state with a voter ID law. Uh, in those kinds of states, typically you can cast a ballot provisionally, but within five or ten days you have to show up at the registrar's office with the proper identification. And, uh, you know, part of the problem is that because we don't have a national ID system, it can take 
uh, it can take a year just to get a birth certificate in some situations, and not everyone has birth certificates. There's still many people, uh, particularly the the senior generation, who were born at home and they didn't give birth certificates for being born um, in the in the back room in a Nebraska farmhouse. So, uh, but we saw in California the problem with lack of transparency. We had, under the prior Secretary of State, an exact match requirement. And in Los Angeles County, one out of every four voters attempting to register was never placed on the voter rolls because uh, of a name issue, a misspelling, some of them probably were people who didn't match and uh, shouldn't have been placed on the rolls. But the Los Angeles County took the position that those names, because they were not yet voters, were not public record. So there was no way for a researcher to get that list of people who had attempted to register and not been successful to be able to see who they are. So uh, it's not relevant in California now because that's not the way we do things. But um, that is a great example of the problem with not, not only is, are they not getting on the rolls, but we aren't going to have any public discussion of who they are. So the, the absentee numbers are going up all the time, aren't yes. they? People seem to be, because obviously you can't change this antique, antique idea that you have to vote on a Tuesday. That, that, that would require a... A constitutional amendment, with it. but so it seems like we, you have a kind of creeping reform, if you will, with with uh, absentees. Is there well, a, there's a raging debate about that too. Well, uh, I frequently run into people who believe that no one should be able to allow uh, to vote absentee, or now we call it vote by mail in California, right. because absentee, when we have 58 percent of the people voting by mail, absentee is a fairly antiquated term to apply right. to it. But don't you have, isn't the problem with it, you, you, you've got to vote earlier than the last minute, in other words, you can't make up your mind to the last minute? Is well, that you can't, you don't have to vote a lot earlier, you, if you, our mail is typically one or two days. Uh, uh -huh. I tell people typically if you haven't mailed your ballot, by the Friday before the Tuesday, or certainly by the Saturday, please don't mail it on Monday. But our law allows you to drop it off at any polling place in your county on election day, and many members of your household can deliver uh -huh. it for you. So you can, in fact, uh, decide. We also have a law that allows you to waive your rights to privacy and fax in your ballot. Right, but if you voted, what, what's, the, what's the first date uh, allowable? Uh, well, we're for military voters, right. I mailed ballots. We began mailing ballots on September 5th. Uh, so but the dynamics of the race in, in September 5th are going to be different. Indeed. But there are November 3rd. There are people who are, uh, the, the standard ballots began to go out uh, last week, and there are people who already know and have turned their ballots around immediately. The, the people who are the most partisan on both ends of the bell curve tend to be those people who vote immediately. Uh, there are other people who've learned the hard way that in a race that's fluid, something can happen the day after you mail in your ballot that makes you change your mind. And what we saw in February and June was people holding on to those absentee ballots, their vote-by-mail ballots, particularly in February, where the field in the presidential primary was so fluid. I'm sure we had people saying, I don't want to mail this. I'm not sure if my person is still going to be in the race by the time it arrives. But Rick, do you, do you, do you want questions? Do you have anything to say? Cause well, I was just going to say that, uh, back to the provisional ballots point, because I think this is very important uh, nationally. So under this Help America Vote Act, uh, everyone has the right to demand uh, a provisional ballot if they show up at the polls and they are not uh, listed and there's some kind of problem. But the Help America Vote Act does not mandate that the state count the ballot. And so all it, all it mandates is that the ballot be turned in. And so one of my colleagues has called the provisional ballot, the hanging chad of 2008. Uh, if, you know, uh, we have another Florida type situation in a place like New Mexico or Colorado where they've had serious problems with election administration in the last few elections and it came down to provisional ballots, there, uh, there's a lot of disagreement. You know, I talked about having the rules being clear beforehand as to which ballot should count. There's a lot of lack of clarity as to which ballots would count. And so it's a nightmare waiting to happen. And if it doesn't happen in the presidential race, and I actually think the chances of it happening in the presidential race are very small because we'd have to have 
not a close percentage margin, a close actual number of ballots margin, and the, and the chances of that happening again are very small. But it will happen in another race. A race will be determined by provisional ballots, and eventually we're going to have to have some standards, some national standards as to what it takes to count a ballot. But it's part of what I call this hyper-federalized system where the rules are different everywhere, and so uh, there's just a lot of potential for uh, even well-intentioned people to have honest disagreements about which vote should count. And, you know, that can spill over into some very serious problems after Election Day. I, I totally concur. And I think it goes beyond just where, where are their standards, but to, to things like um, in Georgia, in a, an absentee ballot is required to be notarized. Now, imagine that you are stationed in Afghanistan and you finally get your ballot and you need to find a notary. Uh, now, one of your uh, commanding officers, certain kinds of commanding officers can fill that function, but if you're an overseas voter, and we have many overseas voters, uh, civilians who are uh, supporting troops in Iraq and Afghanistan as well as just people living abroad, a notary is not, not easy to come by. And yet the Secretary of State there, despite having failed to get a bill through her legislature to remove that, has said, well, but I don't think the federal government should step in with a standard requirement. My view is the federal government should step in with a basic level of fairness and equal access to the ballot. One person, one vote demands that the rules be the same at a basic level in every state. And I think eventually that case will be brought and will be successful. But uh, uh, on the other hand, the, the Indiana law that was taken all the way to the Supreme Court, which was a very partisan law, that stands, doesn't it? I mean. The, that's the the uh, law that requires a picture ID, a government ID, issue. It's yeah. a very restricted, restrictive right. law. Questions from the audience. Um, we have microphones on both sides, I believe. And please wait till the microphone comes yeah, to you. The, the lady uh, with the blonde hair in the row you just passed. Thank you. Thank you. I. I I'm Sherry Myers, and I am an organizer here in town with Work the Vote LA, and we will be poll monitoring this election. And my question has to do with the, um, it, with the hackability of the machines. I still have m many friends and associates who are very concerned that the machines are still able to be hacked. And they are, we're trying to really look at what would be a measure that a citizen could do on election day that we could put in place to assure people that the votes at the precinct were the same as the votes at the end of the election day. And perhaps you have a suggestion, okay? Funny, Thank you. I do. Um, actually, for lar in large measure in California, we're not using machines. We are voting on paper ballots that are marked by the voter. They can be counted by a machine, and the concern then is about the tabulating or counting equipment. And the reason that I have been such, um, have had such a bug about auditing is that is how we determine when we have to go back to the original records. If you have the original records, which they do now in Florida, but you have a state law that prohibits a hand count, you might as well not have the original records. So, um, it, and Los Angeles has a, a bit of an odd system because we use what is an old punch card system that has been adapted by the use of an ink dauber rather than a stylus. And it, it actually, there's a good story about people reading instructions. The first year they did that, they got a lot of complaints from people who were getting vote by mail ballots saying, you forgot to, boy, you didn't score the ballot well, I can't punch the hole out. Um, you know, people do what they're used to. But if we, if the, the ideal situation would be to have a uh, scanner in the precinct to scan all of the ballots at the completion of the election day and to post those numbers publicly outside the precinct, uh, then if they don't match what happens when you take them to the central headquarters, you know you have an issue. We do something approaching that right now because a rough reconciliation has to be done. How many people signed in? How many people actually voted? How many spoiled ballots? How many provisional ballots are there? Uh, we don't get what the count is, but 
it becomes very difficult to add, say, 2,000 or subtract 800 from the raw numbers because that will be picked up. Then if you do a random sampling and nobody knows in advance which precincts will be sampled and you hand count every single race in every ballot and it doesn't match the machine tally, then under my new auditing rules, you automatically, automatically expand the hand count so that you pick up anything. Now, I don't know that we're in statistically in the right place for the number yet. This is a beginning effort uh, that I've undertaken using statisticians, accountants, uh, election officials, and just members of the public. But that's, it's basically belt and suspenders. Um, and all of it has to be done publicly so that anyone can observe any stage of it. It's hard to see. Yes. That. Um, hi. We, I bring this question from myself and also from an admirer of yours, Cindy Asner. She is totally concerned, and I am, and a lot of us are, that the that, that stuff that's being done right now prior to the election all over this country are gonna, is going to steal votes from Barack Obama, that the Republicans have, have caged and suppressed the vote so much that, that we're not going to be able to have a fair election. And I'm wondering what advice you would give to Barack Obama and his, um, and his campaign team as to how he could take preventative measures now. We understand that he is prepared on election day to go in, but we think that a pound of, uh, you know, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure in this case, that he's not taking, taking the steps he needs to take right now to prevent what could be a catastrophe and could you know, wind up with a lot of... Uh, I well, don't know if people are going to sit back quietly this time when they, if they steal the election. First, I, I have to say that um, I, I am not in the um, – it's not my job to give any campaign advice, but I am concerned for the long-term good of this country about either party or any party uh, or any person, even if they're not party-affiliated, doing anything that uh, interferes with the integrity of the election and the rights of eligible voters – um, in any respect. I uh, also have to say that I can really only speak directly to what's happening in California, and I certainly have had my hands full dealing with what's happening in California. I do note, and Rick, maybe you can talk about this, uh, the litigation in Michigan over the potential for um, caging involving people or other disenfranchisement involving people who've been uh, had foreclosures and who've moved. California law is more, um, uh, we make it actually fairly hard to challenge a voter in the polling place. Um, you know, we tend to, uh, you can do it, but it's a very different process in California than it is in some other states. We also don't have the history that some other states do, and I refer to my, uh, my home state of Illinois where I cast my first vote. Um, on a lever voting machine where the, the motto was vote early and often. I don't want anybody voting often in California. Early is fine with me, but I, I really have to, um, I, ca I cannot take on the responsibility for states other than California. But do you want to talk about the foreclosure issue? Yeah, well, let me just say more generally, I, um, I actually am friends with both uh, Obama and McCain's election lawyers. <laughs> and um, they're both, uh, I, uh, I, uh, co-edit a, a, a journal, and they're both on the board, and they're both um, very nice people when you talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, but uh, they're pit bulls without lipstick. They, they, are, uh, they are fighting aggressively, and Michigan is a good example. So in Michigan, a, uh, the guy who was the um, head of the Macomb County Republican Party gave an interview to a uh, left-leaning um, online newspaper called the Michigan Messenger, where he uh, allegedly said, I don't want to be sued for defamation, um, as the uh, blog has been sued. Uh, he allegedly said that uh, they were going to use foreclosure lists as a basis for challenging voters. And uh, he has now asked for retraction and is, he is suing, the li literally has filed suit for, for defamation. Um, but Obama, uh, the Obama team came in and they filed a lawsuit trying to get an injunction barring the Michigan um, uh, the Michigan uh, Republican Party from using foreclosure lists as a basis for uh, a challenge. Uh, so uh, you know, I, I, I have no doubt that uh, the Obama campaign, just like the McCain campaign, 
they're really on top of this. I mean, they're, in fact, I think they're overly on top of this. Uh, and I think it actually adds to an atmosphere of distrust. I'm not one, I, you know, this is what I do all the time. I'm not one who believes that there's uh, a lot of illegal, uh, I don't think there's a lot of voter fraud going on, and I don't think there's a lot of illegal voter suppression going on. What I do think is going on is a lot of legal vote caging, which may be done uh, with bad intent, and it may be done uh, as an effort to uh, kick more people likely to vote Democratic off the rolls, but it's being done legally. And so the changes that need to be made are changes to the laws. So it shouldn't be as it used to be in Ohio that you could just walk in with no evidence and challenge anyone at the polling place and hold up the line for two hours. So the laws need to be changed, and if the laws are changed, then uh, that, that will um, you know, help alleviate some of the problems. Part of the point there is that it, regardless of whether or not you're successful with that particular voter, you've just held the line up for two hours. And that may be the point of some of this, um, not just about the particular voter. It may be, it also may be to roil up fears so that people think, oh, my vote's not going to count, so why should I bother? Um, one of the reasons I did this review is to put some of those, to set up procedures so that uh, we wouldn't be getting those kinds of questions in California. I would say that there were um, 30, it was a, ch a threat for there to be 35,000 challenges in Ohio uh, in 2004. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court the morning of the election, which gave the green light to go ahead with these challenges, and then no challenges materialized. So a lot of this is trying to uh, discourage people from showing up at the polls out of fear of long lines. Question on this side. Do um, touch screens still exist across the country? And if they do, is there a means of uh, the paper trail or auditing for them? It, it's, it, uh, the, the, I think we've reached the, we've already passed the plateau of the use of touch screens. There was a point where they were, I think, approaching 40% of the, of the use of voters in this country, and it's been declining, in part because places like Florida have uh, given up the machines. But uh, they're still in use in some states, and in California, uh, I believe there's still one in each precinct that's being there used. There can be. Some, some precincts use the auto mark, which is um, not a touch screen for disabled access. And on the question of the voter verified paper trail, it's a state by state issue. And so it's, there's no, uh, despite some efforts of um, some members of Congress to try and mandate that, there's no, there's no mandated requirement for that. Down in front here. Hi. <laughs> I work for you. Um, <laughs> I'm a precinct coordinator. and uh, You work for the county. I work well. Okay. We all work. <laughs> but um, as far as what I'm hearing, I, you know, I try to make sure that is everybody can vote and everybody's able to vote provisionally if there's an issue. I'm, what I'm hearing is they're not being counted. Are, I think or that's are not, they being counted? I think is in, that in California... Um, you know, here, here's an example. We had somebody who voted, many somebodies who voted saying, uh, came to the uh, polls to vote in the Republican primary and said, I changed my re registration, I should be allowed to vote. Their name was on the list as a declined to state voter or American Independent Party voter, and they said, I changed my registration at the Department of Motor Vehicle. What we require is, in California is not proof that you changed your registration at the DMV, um, but your declaration that you made a good faith effort mm -hmm. uh, to register while you were changing your address. And then, you know, so those ballots are in fact counted in California. I think, yeah, I think I don't be confused about California versus the rest of the country. The fact is that the rules are different in every state. In California, uh, you have a much better chance of having your provisional ballot counted if you're entitled to vote than in a lot of other places. But, but are, are there provisional ballots counted regardless of the, the percentage of, you know, who's winning and by what margin? Absolutely, yeah. Oh. One of the great myths that we have is that, and I get this in the military all the time, is that our ballots aren't, don't count if there's already a winner. But first, this doesn't make any sense because we aren't just voting for a president. We have a whole host of other races, and while even when, when there's a huge difference in that race, 
Um, there may well be many races that are extremely close, and some of which are not decided until after Election Day. Uh, one of my early lessons in this as a legislator was in 1994 when um, Susan Brooks won, I think it was by six votes in the 36th Congressional District on election night, flew to Washington, D.C., was sworn in, um, and then when the count was completed, Jane Harmon had won by, I think it was 93 votes, 89 or 93 votes, and she flew to Washington and was sworn in. And that's happened at the state level, too. Uh, Patrick Johnston, state senator from Stockton, once won by eight votes using the provisional ballots and absentee ballots that were um, came to the polling place on election day. So all of those ballots are counted regardless of what we do or don't know or think we know, because a lot of the races you actually can't tell because they, they don't conf they don't, uh, they're not neatly within a precinct boundary. But nobody's going to follow up if, for example, um, you know, let's take the 2004 election in Ohio uh, for president. Um, there were many problems with the Ohio, the way the Ohio election was administered. But the difference between the Kerry votes and the Bush votes were about 104,000 votes. And so the Kerry lawyers made the decision that uh, uh, there was, uh, the election was beyond the margin of litigation. It was not going to help to fight over every single ballot. So there were probably some provisional ballots that arguably should have been counted that weren't, or the other way that shouldn't have been counted that were. It's only when the spotlight's on that these things are going to tend to matter for the outcome. Uh, but uh, uh, a lot of, you know, people don't follow up to find out if their provisional ballot was I think that's counted. true, and it's one of the reasons that I've sponsored uh, legislation, for example, that says if you, f if you send an absentee ballot and it's not counted, your county has to tell you that and they have to tell you why. Unfortunately, the governor just vetoed that bill. Um, not on the merits, but saying that it wasn't important. I'm going to be working with counties and encouraging them to do that. I hate to see somebody whose ballot's not counted uh, because for their signature has changed um, as, they, as they have aged, which ha can happen to anyone, uh, or for various other reasons. So uh, I think the same standard ought to eventually be applied to provisional ballots. We need to tell people if their vote wasn't counted at all or was only partially counted which can also happen. If you vote in the wrong precinct, um, your provisional ballot will count in the races in which you were entitled to vote, but you know, if you voted in the wrong, the wrong precinct and you voted for some races that you, where you didn't live in that district, obviously we can't count that, but people should know that. Your vote didn't count in these races because you didn't vote with the, on the right ballot. There's, Secretary Bowen, there's, there's an expectation that there'll be a a sort of surprise in, or in terms of more of a sweep for Obama because there's this hidden factor of the youth vote that don't have cell phones that the pollsters don't know. And, and in 04 I worked for Rock the Vote and we registered a whole bunch of, of, of a couple of million but they didn't necessarily vote. Now that, I don't think we'll have that problem in 08. I think people who registered will vote but what I wanted to understand is with all of those people in, fr in front of supermarkets that sign up energetic young people throughout the country, and I know you can only speak for California, but give us a guess on whether if this is a kind of below the iceberg effect that, w that the youth vote's going to come out big, what percentage of them are going to be disappointed, do you think? Oh, I, abs I can't even begin to... <laughs> yeah. I mean, is it... How... how I just wonder how... how I, rickety I know, our system is, you know? I, I know from from the work of, of some um, nonprofit organizations that the fastest growing group of uh, voters registering and voting is voters under the age of 30. Uh, we know that statistically, but in I, the numbers that I'm seeing in California of voter registration cards and of phone calls are so enormous compared to what the people who work in the Secretary of State's office in elections have seen in the 20 or 25 years they've worked in the office that it's hard to know. But And it's so different from state to state that, um, I don't know, all I can do is look at what happened, what has already happened in a state like Iowa where people said, well, the young people won't come to caucus. And they did. In Virginia, I know that um, the Democrats made a tremendous voter registration effort and something like 40 percent of the voters were under 25 which is pretty... You know, there are still, there are some states that um, make it very difficult for students, for example, to vote, uh, 
who are going to school elsewhere to vote by mail. So there's also that factor. I mean, they're, they're really, this vote varies greatly by state. Uh, the result is some students have decided to re-register where they're going to school because they know they can vote in person there, and that's a wild card because nobody knows how many people have done that. And that's proven to be controversial. Um, there were um, the, some Virginia County registrars. Virginia is one of these states that we expect uh, is, at least now, is close. And uh, some, of, some Virginia County registrars were s sending out incorrect information, for example, that college students who vote in their Virginia college town could no longer be claimed as dependents on their parents' income tax. And uh, so there's a lot of, the, a lot of that uh, false information going around. And uh, if you go to the Brennan Center's website, they actually have a guide for student voting that tries to walk through the different requirements. And it basically depends upon where you are uh, intending to live uh, for the foreseeable future, which we call domicile. And that is typically uh, something that a, a student can claim where he or she is going to college. Uh, but uh, there's been a lot of that uh, controversy over that as well. Gentleman down in the front here. Hi, Ms. Bona. I'm proud to say I worked on your first campaign when you when we were running for a more partisan office in Santa Monica. Uh, I had a couple of questions. One is, I know you have sort of a nonpartisan position, but in terms of changing our uh, election laws, uh, since California is often a place where we do experiments, and I'm, there's a couple of things that don't make sense about our election system. One, of course, is just voting on Tuesdays. Uh, besides the mail-in ballots, it seems like we should pioneer the idea of being able to vote on weekends or vote on more than one day, and one of those would be a weekend day. Uh, the other thing is the idea that I know they do in San Francisco or something about where it, the, you vote for the first person, then you have a second choice. Instant runoff voting. The instant runoff voting where you know, a third party actually has a chance. Right now they have no chance. So those two reforms, that can be sort of advocated you know, for California, because if California starts to adopt that, um, which I know neither of the two main parties would like that idea, at least the runoff uh, provision. Well, there, we there's, a, there's a third one that I might start with, which is that the governor just signed a bill that would, if people approve it in the, in the 2010 election, create a public financing system for the Secretary of State's race in the year 2014. So people will have a chance to decide whether or not they want to see the Secretary of State's office um, campaigns be publicly funded. I, I think that would go an enormous way towards helping uh, alleviate partisanship. And it's a trial for that one office. Um, we do have some places that are using the instant runoff voting or single transferable vote. I think the next logical place where we may see that in California is in special elections or runoffs, where we typically spend a lot of money and get an extremely low turnout. Uh, when we did the special election after uh, Congresswoman M Melinda McDonald passed away, we had, I think, a, an 11 percent turnout. Uh, and th th that's, a, I think, a place where there's going to be the greatest openness, besides at the city and county level. And there are uh, some cities and a couple counties, including Alameda County, that have already passed uh, ordinances to go in that direction. As far as voting days, um, the, the challenge to moving the election to a weekend is that because we have uh, faiths that celebrate their religious holidays on both Saturday and Sunday, it's hard to choose either one without choosing both. If you keep the polls open for more than one day, you have a difficult problem of securing equipment and ballots overnight. Uh, in 24,009 polling places in the last election. So, uh, and with 58% of our voters voting by mail, it's not clear that, that that's the best return on the investment. Nationally, I actually think because of the problem of the religious holiday, the religious days of observance, I, I'd rather see a holiday on election day, but make it on a Tuesday or a Wednesday so that people don't decide, well, I'm just gonna take a three day weekend and never mind the whole voting thing. I'd also, I'd also add that in a lot of states, um, and we have in parts of California, there's early voting in person where you can show up and uh, you know, at voting centers. And so this is a way. So, so you know, a lot of votes are going to be cast before Election Day. And I don't think people are going to look back on the 2008 election and say, boy, turnout was really low because it was on Tuesday. I expect we're going to have a very big turnout. And people find other ways. In most states, they can find other ways to vote if they can't make it on that Tuesday. And in California, the polls are open for 13 hours, right? 
That's right, and any and anybody can vote by mail who wants to. No excuse. In fact, you can be a permanent vote by mail ba uh, voter and get your ballot in the mail automatically in every election, so long as you continue to vote. Uh, the other question, and I'll, I'm done, is I know this, uh, the general conspiracy, which you guys have sort of like addressed. I, I want to know if this is. I think the general audience would like to know this. Is the main reason that Democrats, in particular, haven't challenged? elections, per, like a lot of African Americans complained in Florida in 2000, is because it, it was bad they were doing the caging, but, but it was legal, and that's why they didn't pursue it, or is there some overriding political reason? I actu actually asked this question in our last forum, and they thought that both parties sort of had an investment in the way things were done now, so that local states didn't really want to rock the boat. Or are you saying that they legal that what they did to to prevent people from voting actually was legal. I'm not sure what specifically you're referring to in Florida. I mean, there were a bunch of different problems, but uh, you know, I think that a lot of people were caught off guard in terms of what happened in Florida, and the litigation was moving very quickly. Remember, we went, uh, it was, I think, 36 days from Election Day until the Supreme Court decided Bush versus Gore, and there was litigation on multiple fronts, and people were gathering facts. I, I was thinking about what Bush versus Gore, that whole period, would have been like if we had blogs and people could get their information out there much more quickly and things might have been different. But I, so I think a big part of it was lack of information as to exactly what was happening. And even today, there's still disputes about the facts of what happened in various counties in, in Florida. I think we, we're, getting, we're getting to the towards the end here. This lady in the front here, further down, there you go. I have one question, and why do we not get receipts when we vote? That drives me crazy. We can go to an ATM machine, um, deposit our money, we get a receipt. Why do we not get a receipt when we vote? Because that, it seems to me that that would be the perfect system. A receipt that says, that says how you voted? Exactly. I'll tell you exactly why, because then people would sell it for $20. And we see it with, if we want to talk about the kind of vote, voter fraud that we actually have in this country, it's with absentee ballots where you can verify how someone's voted. What caused the decline in vote buying in this country is the secret ballot, because you can't verify a transaction. If you can walk around and say, look, I voted for um, Smith for, uh, for dog catcher, well, you know, then people could pay you for it. That's, that's the answer. Now, I'd heard, though, that because the, because the states control it, and I don't know the extent of this, maybe it's anecdotal, but that a lot of wealthy Republicans in the northern states who have the snowbirds that have summer homes in Florida, Arizona, and New Mexico, all of which are swing states, uh, uh, sometimes vote absentee at home and then vote in person. Is there any impediment to that? I mean, it well, it's breaking federal law if you were doing it for president, <laughs> so that's <laughs> probably an impediment. Uh, a, th there have been studies. You know, part of the problem is that people have common names. And so a lot of the studies that find double voting uh, mm. are, uh, in fact, either an error uh, in how the vote was recorded or two people with the same name. But there have been some circumstances. There was also people voting in Kansas City, Kansas, and Kansas City, Missouri. They would go back and forth. And, uh, you know, so th there are some prosecutions for it. Um, there's a lot more of that going on than there is of impersonation fraud, where I, you know, fill out uh, a sign as I'm Ian Masters and I vote your vote because right. I'd be afraid to go to the polling place and say I'm you, I could be turned in. But there are some people who double vote and uh, we don't have a national interoperable database that will tell you that somebody voted in uh, New York and Florida. And if we had that, then that would stop. If ever we had a national voter ID card, right. uh, we would, you know, my, my, my proposal uh, has, and it's a proposal that's united Democrats and Republicans, it's united them against it, uh, is uh, <laughs> that we should have a national voter ID card put out by the federal government which has your thumbprint on it. And so if you lose your card, you still have your thumb, you can vote, you have your thumbprint. Move the signature, and I think eventually we'll, we'll move towards a system that a number of states have uh, where when you get your driver's license, and you've just proved that you're a citizen in California, because that's how you get your driver's license, that you go on to the uh, voter rolls at that point. If we started doing that next year, in 10 or 20 years, we would have a fairly small number of people who would have to register in front of Costco or Target. Um, we always will have people who move from other states who didn't get their first driver's license here who don't have a driver's license. We have a large number of people who don't need a driver's license because they take the bus 
and you don't need a driver's license to take the bus and we have to be we all tend to think that everybody else is like us and they have credit cards and driver's licenses and photo IDs I always hear people say well you need a photo ID to fly we have lots of people who've never in their lives get not gotten on an airplane and who are um, eligible voters and registered voters and whose rights should be respected as well as those of us who do fly um, but nonetheless having that number be smaller in the universe of people who are not um, registered and where we follow the basic data principle of enter data once and then take it where you need it so that you don't have errors in entry which you're going to have registering 16 million people um, I think we'll, we can work then in a much more concentrated fashion on reaching people who don't have a driver's license um, my resources instead of going out to try to get 16 23 million people registered could be focused on the 10 percent who aren't already in the system in some mechanism. So let's just, where's the microphone? Let's make this the last call, this young voter down here in the front, so. Um, I have a question for you, Deborah. I came across a um, memo from your office that said that we can't engage in um, elec electioneering. And basically that means that I can't, as a voter, wear a button, a hat, or a shirt that um, advocates for my candidate and my question is how does that how does that not violate my first amendment and Richard do you have any opinions on that yeah, actually it, the electioneering law is intended to keep people from being feeling pressured in the polling place and uh, just as an example on the other side there was a polling place um, <clears throat> last year in another county where uh, someone filed a complaint because the it was in someone's garage and they had a car parked right outside the garage that had a pro-life bumper sticker on it and there was a complaint about that being electioneering and the person moved his car so you're dealing with the other side of it um, there's actually a court ruling that says that the minor impediment because it's only within a hundred feet of the polling place so you can wear your button up to within 100 feet of the polling place or your hat or your t-shirt but while you're in the polling place we want it to be free from any potential coercion or people's feeling that their neighbors or whatever it is so um, I think there's law that supports yeah, that. Um, uh, for those of you who heard the term strict scrutiny it means the Supreme Court gives its toughest look at something and usually when something is judged under strict scrutiny it fails well in this case this case was called Burson versus Freeman Supreme Court said, yeah, you have a First Amendment right to express yourself, and especially about political speech, but the right to keep the polling place free from people feeling coerced and to vote in a particular way is so important that the state can create a reasonable boundary. And that's what those laws are about. And the laws are different in each state as to whether or not wearing a, a hat or a shirt or a button with a candidate's name on it would constitute electioneering and so it, it at the same at the same time I want to say that you know I don't expect that we're going to have registrars in California who tell people you can't vote well, what's going to happen as has happened for many years is people are going to be asked to remove the button or the hat uh, turn the shirt inside out some counties are getting paper smocks for because people may come to the polling place particularly if they're first-time voters they may not know um, and when you think about it, you know, you really don't want an army of people coming in with a, you know, yes on Prop 7, no on Prop 8, whatever it is. So um, we'll try to make, to, to use some kind of reason and handle it in a way that gives everyone the right to vote, but still preserves that zone that is free from um, political messages. Well, I'd like to thank Professor Rick uh, Hassan and... Secretary of State Deborah Bowen. Now, I, I want to remind you, though, that next, uh, what is it, week from Thursday, October the 16th, we're going to have a panel here uh, with Bob Baer, the former CIA officer who George Clooney played in the movie Suriana. Uh, he's, he's going to be talking about the possibility of a war with Iran, and the head of the, the largest uh, Iranian-American group is also going to be there. So if uh, any of you are concerned about a third George W. Bush war, come along and get uh, depressed and scared. May, may, <laughs> may I just add that anybody who had a question for me that didn't get answered, um, you can find me at sos.ca.gov. 
Um, we are getting an enormous number of emailed questions this year, which I think is a good thing because it means that we have a lot of, of interest and people who want to make sure that they successfully negotiate the system. So if you don't get an answer in two minutes, it doesn't mean we've forgotten about you. It's just we're, we're really maxing out. But please um, don't hesitate. And Or if there's an issue that concerns you, something that you've seen that we haven't talked about, I'm not able to solve any problems that I don't know about. And the way I know about problems is somebody emails me, calls me, writes me a letter, faxes me. We take faxes. We take um, regular mail. And I really ask you, if you see something that doesn't look right or doesn't seem right, please don't just go home and grumble. Um, email it, put it on a piece of paper, call, let me know. I've had a number of, I actually had uh, somebody who messaged me on Facebook about a registration irregularity that was happening on the, happening on the Sac State Conference. Uh, a ca uh, campus, we sent an investigator and found that the person who was doing the petition gathering work there had an outstanding warrant for his arrest on another initiative, uh, signature gathering related measure. And so we were able to arrest uh, someone who had previously was alleged to have conducted initiative signature gathering fraud. I never would have known that the person was there if somebody hadn't said, this doesn't look right to me and I'm going to check it out. So you can be um, part of our process of preserving the integrity by reporting what you see. Well, thank you all for coming and thank you both. Yes,